Okay, let's go and get started today. Uh, today is going to be a, a topic that I think is going to be uh, a little bit of fun, uh, and hopefully it'll open the door for uh, you to make some fairly complex programs that do some complex things, but do so without a lot of code. And object-oriented programming is the topic today, and it's a little bit different way of thinking about programming than what we have been doing. What we have been doing, let's focus on that first. So what we have been doing is what's called procedural programming. And in procedural programming, essentially, as we've been using it so far, we use variables to represent uh, game data items. So for example, if we want to keep track of the player's x, y position on the screen. We make a variable for that player x, player y. Uh, we put data into that or values into that. Or we want to keep track of our spaceship. It has an x and a y, but not just an x and a y, but an angle and a speed. Uh, like we've done before, so we do that. But notice that all four of these variables are associated with keeping track of some data about the ship. Maybe these two are keeping track of data about the player. Maybe we'd have players underscore score, player underscore health, however many variables you want. So that's creating items in memory that we're keeping track of, using to keep track of stuff about game items uh, as the game is continuing. And then in the code, uh, we might change those. We might also make some functions that we use. So functions help us make our code more modular. Like, for example, we make a draw player function. We pass the x and a y in, and it draws the picture of the player. Or in the case of the spaceship, we say x, y, here's the angle. Maybe we have the other thing of it's thrusting or not to draw the thrust cone, whatever. But we made these uh, functions that we pass data into and they use that data to compute something or draw something or otherwise take some sort of action, uh, code, execution action for us in place of that. And so that's how procedural programming works. It's basically you have uh, variables that keep track of data about things in the game, and we have functions uh, and code that perform some sort of actions uh, that in a lot of cases, we'll use those variables, uh, the variable data, uh, but it'll always produce some sort of action or compute some sort of result or do something with the data in those variables, Ch maybe change it, maybe just use it to draw something. But that's how procedural programming works. It's kind of divided into these. We have variables, and then we have code that does things to the variables or with the variables or because of those variables. So in procedural programming, to kind of summarize, uh, it, it very closely models how the computer works. If you think all the way back to those first couple lectures we had where we talked about how the computer worked, the, we have memory and we have a CPU, and the CPU accesses the memory, gets data out of it, takes some action based on what it finds in the memory, and then puts data back into that memory. And so you notice that the procedural programming very closely models that, that we have variables, that's computer memory. We have functions that let us control the action of the CPU or do things or uh, code that lets us control the CPU and tell it what to do with the stuff in the memory. So even though that closely models how the computer works, it doesn't really closely match uh, something like the real world. In the real world, we have uh, data and function I linked together in the, this natural way in the form of a real world object. So take, for example, uh, I don't know, here's an object this pen. This pen has, is a real world object. It, it's, got a, it's got a location in the world. It also has an angle. Notice I can change the angle, the orientation of it. It also has some other things like the attributes that describe it, like the color. Uh, it has an ink level, which I don't know if you can see that, but there's a little window in the side where you can see the ink level. That is some data about it, the, whether the cap is on or off. And then not only does this uh, have those attributes that describe it. Those are kind of data things that describe it. Has a mass, um, has a color, has a position, all that kind of stuff. But it also has things that it can do. So for example, there are things that can be done to it. For example, even uncapping and capping. That is specific to a pen type object. If I pick up something else, uh, like this cardboard box, that can, has a different set of attributes. It's a different color, it's in a different position, but it also has different things it can do. For example, the pen can be capped and uncapped. I cannot cap and uncap this cardboard box. It doesn't have a cap. But I can do things with this box that I can't do with this pen. For example, uh, kind of opening and closing or storing things inside of it uh, are all things I can do with this box. 
but they also have other things that can be done to them as well, like applying a force to them to make them move, like push the box and it jumps, push the pen and it jumps. So they have some things in common. They have some things that are different, but basically it all boils down to kind of attributes or kind of like the adjectives that describe something. And then the other part is kind of the functions or what can be done to that thing or what can that thing do. So that is basically how object-oriented programming works, is we gather together the attributes that describe something and the, uh, the things that it can do, but we group it together in the form of that one object. So it's still variables, it's still data, it's still functionality like code, but we're kind of organizing it in a way that's organized around thinking of objects. So the code is organized in a way that more closely models those real world objects. And let's think of that ball example we did uh, last class where we had a ball kind of moving around on the screen. So if we think about the uh, attributes or things that might describe that ball or some adjectives about it or things about it, you might come up with a list of what we'd call or think of as the object variables or the variables that would store that. So this is very similar to variables that we would have in a procedural program. You might think, well, a ball has a color, it's got a size, maybe a diameter, a position, where is it? And then how fast is it moving and what direction it's moving? So those are all things that might uh, we might come up with as variables that would describe that. Now, not only that though, but we also have this concept of things that it can do or things that can be done to it. So that's what we're gonna call object methods. So notice we have two terms here. We have object attributes, excuse me, and object methods. And an object attribute is basically data about it. And a method is code that does something either with that or because of that thing, and that's a method. So methods for a ball might be, it can be moved, it can be rendered or drawn on the screen, and we could apply a force to it, which would change how it's moving. And we're gonna ignore this apply force one for right now, we'll come back to that later, but move and render. Uh, if we just wanted a ball that bounces off the walls, like we did before, we would have to be able to move it to its next position. And we would have to be able to draw where it is right now. So these attributes and methods uh, for di are, might be different for different types of objects. And we saw that here. So this pen has different attributes and different methods, different capabilities than this cardboard box, which has different attributes and capabilities than this giant metal washer, which has different attributes and capabilities than this uh, red swing line stapler. Uh, this can staple things. This cannot. This stores ink inside it, has an ink level. This has a number of staples inside of it. So notice that different objects have different data associated with them, but also have different actions. We can't staple things with a pen. We can't staple things with a cardboard box, but we can staple things with a stapler. I can write with a pen, but I can't write with a cardboard box, and I can't write with a stapler. So the idea is we're going to organize our code that way to say this object has this data associated with it and these things that it can do. And we're going to make different types of objects. So a starting point for that is what's called a class. And what a class is, uh, it's a thing that we're going to define, kind of like we define functions, but classes are a little bit different because they're a blueprint that defines a certain type of object. And that blueprint is going to describe both the attributes and the methods or the object variables, the data, and the object functions, the actual uh, code that's going to be carried out in those different uh, capabilities. So the class definition describes the attributes, it describes the methods, or the variables and functions associated with that object. But remember, it's a blueprint. We're not actually making an object yet. We're just making a, a class. We're making a thing that says this is a type of object that we're going to want to create. And once we've made that class, we can then use it, the blueprint, to build objects, actual objects in memory, and those are gonna be called instances. So we can make multiple instances. So think of the, the class as like a blueprint that's used at the factory, and then we can stamp out objects from that that will all have that data, and those methods or those functions associated with that data uh, all together. And you might notice that's true with like these, like we mentioned the pens. It just so happens I have two pens. I have a red one and this blue one. And notice that they are the same other than the color. So we could have the factory when we create these things, like say make an instance of a pen, make it color blue, bam. Make an instant, another instance of a pen, make it color red. And I can, now these are two independent things that have their own attributes and their own data, 
but they're both made from the same blueprint. They just have the color being different and they have a different amount of ink in them. And then I could even make two of them that have the same color, like this red one over here versus the red one over here. Those are two different objects, but they look the same. They kind of perform the same function. They do have a different ink amount because one of them I've used, uh, this one has almost full ink. This one has completely full ink, but this one's been used more than this one. So notice that they're different objects with different data, even though they were uh, produced at the same factory by the same, using the same set of attributes and the same set of capabilities and methods. So once we create that class, we can make as many object instances from it as we need for our project. All right, let's look at a quick, simple example first. And this is an object or an example for a coin. So notice that we're defining a class. So we want to define a class, we use the word class, and then we give it a name, coin. Now it's kind of the, uh, it's not required that we make that a capital letter in the front of the name of a class, but it's by convention in Python uh, that we do that. And that's so when we see that later on in our code, we know that that's an object class. That's a class that we're using. Normal variables that we use, like local variables, global variables, whatever, you should not have those capitalized. We want to keep those lowercase. And that allows us to distinguish when we look at our code, hey, this is a class, I can tell that because it starts with a capital, versus uh, some variable called coin that would be a lowercase. So class coin, and then in parentheses after that object. And this object thing here, um, that's uh, something that is done in Python to allow this object we're creating to inherit some things from kind of the generic object class. But in our case, don't worry too much about why you put that, just say, all right, we're making a class coin, it's gonna be an object, so we put the word object in parentheses there. Now later on, we're gonna be able to make classes that inherit from other classes that we create. Uh, so for example, we make a generic vehicle class and then we wanna make a, uh, a sports car that's a subclass of that or a tractor trailer that's a subclass of that or something like that. Or maybe you have like non-player character that's a generic uh, non-player character, but then beneath that you might have I don't know, like non-player character wizards that have different capabilities. They can cast spells. Uh, maybe you have a, a thief subclass or a um, warrior subclass or uh, something like that. But right now, don't worry about all that. Just think when I make a class, I'm just going to put object in parentheses. Now indented underneath there, we have all these things that look like functions. And those things that look like functions, those are the methods. So basically, in this uh, coin thing, we have this weird one that says underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore. And then we have this def flip and def look at. So we have basically three methods. This one at the top is a special one that's called the constructor. And that one runs automatically at the factory whenever we create one of these. So in other words, whenever I create a coin instance, it's going to get uh, a type, it's going to get a year, and it's going to get a, uh, a side that is up. And then we have this flip, which basically just randomly picks whether it's heads or tails. When at the factory, when they're all stamped out, they all are stamped out with 2020 on them and heads up. And so in this case, when we flip it, it could be randomly choose between heads or tails. And then when you look at it, it'll say your uh, self.year, self.type. So it'll say your 2020 penny is on and then side up. And that, I modified it a little bit on the second example here uh, just to make it so you could type this in without having to worry about calling it a penny. And then over here, I basically said penny equal coin, dime equal coin. And then I could look at them. They'll both say heads and then I can flip both of them and look at them again. And now they might say heads, they might say tails because we flipped both of them. But you'll notice that uh, this code here, the way we have it written, is we're defining what a coin looks like and what we can do to it. It gets created at the factory. In this case, it gets a year and a side that's facing up. And then we can flip it, which will randomly change the side that's facing up. And then we can look at it and it will tell us what year is on the coin and which side is currently facing up. And we can notice that over here, when we make those instances of that, we can make as many of those as we want. Here we're just making two. We're storing them in a variable, one called penny, one called dime. But each of those have their own year, their own side up. So they each have their own attributes, but they also each can be looked at. They each have their own method look at, and they each have their own method flip that we've defined. 
And so notice this is something that more closely models the real world. In other words, create a pen, bam. Uh, this is the red pen, uncap the red pen. So red pen dot uncap, red pen dot recap, uh, red pen dot move, red pen dot rotate. So uh, all of those things that we can do to real world objects like stapler dot staple, click, staple, stapler dot uh, look at how many staples are inside it. Stapler dot reload, kind of like putting ammo into it. So all and every time you operate, stapler dot operate, the amount that's inside it goes down a little bit, just like when I write with a pen, the amount of ink inside it goes down a little bit. So this is the kind of thing that we're going to think about. Let's look at uh, that ball example we talked about earlier. So here's a class for a ball. And notice the, this uh, constructor that we have here, this special uh, thing. We'll talk about that a little more in a second. But that is what runs at the factory. So whenever I create a new ball, this automatically gets executed. So we create an X, a Y, a size, angle, speed, color. And here I'm just kind of randomly assigning those except for the color is always getting red. So every ball when it's created at this factory is red, but they're in a different position. They're at the same, uh, they're, they're in a random position with a random size, but in some range, moving in a random direction at a random speed. That, notice we're provided ranges for these. So when we create a new ball, it's going to start out maybe going in a different, at a different position, going in a different direction, at a different speed. Now that, uh, and then here's render. It just does a circle, draws a circle of the the ball's color, self.color, self.x, self.y, self.size. Now this self thing is a special uh, it's always the first parameter of any of these methods that are in here. We always put self as the first parameter in that list. And that gives a way for that object to reference the parts of the data itself. In other words, uh, for example, me, I could look at myself and say, well, this is my shirt. I could cut my hair. That's part of me. That I, and so that's what this self is allowing to do. It's saying this variable X is part of this object. It's the X variable of this object instance, the one, the one that we're on right now. It's part of itself. And notice the reason they did that is that distinguishes between that, the parts of the object, the object variables, and these kind of local variables that are just needed temporarily, like dx and dy down here. And so that gives us a way to say, to refer explicitly to the things that are part of the object instance and things that are uh, local variables or global variables or something else. So we're always going to use self dot uh, before that. And notice we're, we're used to that by like pygame, uh, dot draw dot that kind of dot notation but here self is referring to the object instance that was created from that class blueprint all right so a little bit on here that special uh, method there that is called the constructor it runs automatically when an instance is created so we don't have to call underscore underscore init underscore underscore uh, when we create an object if when I create one that'll happen automatically and that keyword self is used to refer to the object uh, attribute variables uh, directly. So self.size, self.speed, self.color, whatever. I always put the self in front of those. And then those methods can still use local variables that are not part of that, like dx and dy are being used down here. Now, remember that when we define this class, that's just a blueprint. We have not created an object when we've done that. We've created a kind of a blueprint for making an object. So to create an actual object, we need to actually create an instance of that. And we do that by calling this thing as if it were a function. Notice that's the same name as the name of our class here. And then we're storing that in a variable. So now we have ball one, which is a ball object, which means that I can move it and I can render it. And when I move it, it's going to call this code here and update its position to a new position. And then when I render it, it's going to draw that at whatever position it's at on the screen. And in fact, we can make a lot of instances of that. We don't have to just make one. We can make ball one, ball two, ball three. And each of these are going to have their own attributes. So they're all going to have their own x, ball one dot x, ball two dot x, ball three dot x. They're all going to have their own y, ball one dot y, ball two dot y, ball three dot y, they're all going to have their own color, ball one dot color, ball two dot color, ball three dot color, their own speed, their own. And so when I, I could then go through and say, move ball one, ball one dot move, ball one dot render, ball two dot move, ball two dot render, uh, and so forth. Now, 
let's actually go over to Python and write some code uh, to get this to actually work. So I'm going to write that uh, code in kind of that more procedural way first. And then we're going to convert it over to object oriented. But what we're going to end up doing when we convert it to an object oriented implementation is we are going to uh, write a ball class. We're going to define the attributes for it, just like we had back here. We're going to define the methods uh, that here are the attributes that go inside of the constructor, or at least self dot things. We're going to define the methods, the constructor, and then the other ones, render and move. And then we're going to make instances uh, of objects from that class. And so we'll just make like uh, one ball to start with, and then we'll convert it to two, and then maybe three. And then we're going to come back here and add another thing that's going to really make this powerful uh, in just a second. All right, so let me uh, bring up a Python uh, shell here. And let me switch it over so you can see what I'm doing. So give me just a second here. And let me move this so you can see the whole thing. Let's just put it there. All right, that looks pretty good there. All right, so what I'm going to do is this is going to be ball example. And let's call this OOP ball. And OOP stands for Object Oriented Programming. And that's just that kind of other way of organizing your code that rather than making variables and making functions and code that interacts with those variables, we're going to make a class. Now we're going to start, let's just get the framework of this uh, working. So Pygame, import that. Uh, pygame.init. And well, let's also import random because we were using that. And we're going to need math. And let's just get the main structure of this working first. So let's do our while loops, our game loop here. Uh, actually, before we do that, we need to make our display. So display surface equal pi game dot display dot set mode. And we're going to pass 800 by 600 to that. We've done that a lot of times. Now down here, we're going to say while well, true. Inside of this loop, we're going to say uh, pi game.event.pump and keys equal pi game dot key dot get pressed and then if keys sub pi game dot k underscore escape so if they press the escape key we break out of the game loop and then after that game loop we're going to do a pi game dot display dot quit. And then at the bottom of our loop, we're going to need to update the display pi game, game dot display dot update. Okay, so now before I add any of the stuff to make the ball bounce around, uh, let's go ahead and do that. So let's run this, make sure this works so far. Call this ball one. And there's our window. We hit escape, the window closes. All right, so everything's working so far. So now let's add the code for the ball. Let's do it a non-object oriented way first, and then we're gonna convert that. So if we were doing this previously, We'd say ball one x. Let's just say ball x equal random dot rand int zero through seven ninety nine, and then ball y zero to five ninety nine, and then maybe ball uh, angle. And since there's 360 degrees, it will generate a random integer angle 0 to 359. And let's do ball speed. Let's go 0 0.1 to 1.0. 
ball color. Let's just make it red. Ball size equal. Let's just make it five. Okay, so now we made a bunch of variables, and now in my code, I need to actually now do something to actually draw that and move that. So let's just draw it first here. So let's do uh, render ball. So this is going to be uh, pygame dot draw dot circle, and for the circle, we need the we're going to put it on the display surface, and this is going to be. Uh, ball color and the position here int of ball x int of ball y and we're putting that in around those to make sure those are integers because otherwise it complains and then here this is going to be ball uh, size and solid filled in all right so there's rendering it and let's, before we render it, let's go ahead and move it. So here, move ball. So to move it, uh, we're gonna compute the dx, we're gonna compute the dy, and we know how to do that. We've done that before, so this is gonna be ball speed times uh, math dot, now this is dx, so that's gonna be cosine, that's left and right. So cosine math dot radians of ball angle. So there's my dx. And then let's make this the dy. dy is going to be the same, except this is going to be sine. And this needs to be negative 1 to account for the inverted axes. And now let's update the position of it. So let's do ball x plus equal dx ball y plus equal dy. So this is all stuff we've done before. Now right now that ball can leave the screen, so we might want to uh, make it bounce. So let's actually make it bounce here. So like, And if you remember how to make it bounce off the edges, we basically had a number of if statements. It basically said if ball x ever gets to be less than zero, and that means it bounced, so then what we want to do is do uh, dx times equal negative 1. And we could actually uh, do this for all of, to make it bounce, we could do this for all of these. So dx times equal negative 1, we probably also want to move the ball x equal to 0. So it didn't, we didn't let it go negative and leave the screen. We just inverted it to make it go the other direction and moved it back against the edge. And now we want to do that for the other, other possible edges as well. So in other words, if the ball x ever gets to be greater than 799, then ball x equals 799 and invert the dx. Now let's do the same thing for y. So if ball y gets to be less than zero, then invert the dy and set the ball y equal to zero. And then finally, if ball y ever gets to be greater than 599, then invert dy and then ball y equal 599. Now, now, because we, it may have bounced, we now need to convert the dx and dy back into a new angle. So ball angle equal math dot degrees of math dot a tan 2 minus dy dx. And notice we didn't really change the speed. Uh, we could recompute the speed here if we wanted to. Uh, and that way, if we wanted to add friction or something later where the speed got to be a little bit smaller, we could add that. But for right now, uh, since we're not changing the speed, I'm just going to leave it like that. Now, let's run this and see what we get uh, and see if we actually get that ball moving uh, and bouncing. And there it is. And notice that it is doing that, but it's leaving a trail. Right now, that's kind of cool to see that trail. 
but let's go ahead and uh, clear the screen so we don't have that trail bang left behind. And let's make the ball a little bit larger since it might be hard for you guys to see that at home. Let's make that ball size 10. All right, so to clear the screen before the render here, we're going to do a display surface dot fill of black. Oops, I left out a parenthesis. So display surface fill, there's the color of black. And then we render the ball. So this line here is clearing the screen. Now, none of this is object oriented right now, but let's run it and then we're going to convert this to be object oriented. Okay, so there's the ball bouncing off the sides uh, just as we had um, wanted it to. Now, before we convert this to an object oriented form, let's look at that code one more time. Now notice that if I wanted to create two balls, rather, or three or four, rather than just one, I'd need more another set of variables. Maybe I call this ball one, for all those, I call it, call it ball uh, two for the other one. And if I wanted to have 10 of these, I might need 10 sets of these, or I'd have to store all this stuff in a list somehow. Now let's go ahead and convert this to object-oriented, uh, an object-oriented example. And actually before I do that, this is the non-oop example. Let me go and just save that like that. And then I'm gonna switch and we're gonna make an object-oriented example. So I'm going to call this oop ball. Okay, so this one is going to be very similar, but we're going to make a class. So up here uh, at the top of the program, I'm going to go to make that class. So here's a class. I'm going to call it ball. We put object in parentheses and then indented underneath that. The first, usually you want to have your constructor first. So we just name that underscore underscore in it underscore underscore. And that's a special name that's Python, that Python uses to say this is the constructor. There are some other ones of those special things as well. There's what's called the destructor, which when you delete or destroy an object, that'll run automatically. Uh, you can also have ones when you try to print an object or convert it to a string uh, format, underscore, underscore, str, underscore, underscore. Uh, there's versions of it when you use the object in a, uh, um, an expression that you can use. It gives the value of it. There, there's several of those, but the one that we're going to focus on right now is just that one. All right, so inside of that, that's where we're going to create these object variables. So I'm just going to copy these. I'm going to paste them up here. And then as a kind of keyboard shortcut here, if I highlight those and do control and then kind of the right bracket, I can move those things over. And notice you can also get to that up here if you go to format and it says like um, indent region, control right bracket. So you can see those shortcuts up here. So that can be helpful rather than having to type all that. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of this ball underscore and that's going to become self dot. So now we're saying this particular object type has an X, it has a Y, it has an angle, a speed, a color, and a size. Now I'm also going to have up here the code for my render uh, method. And we already had code that kind of rendered that down here. So let's go down there and get that. So that was this. Now here, I'm going to come back and fill that in here in a little bit, but right now we're just going to leave that blank. So render, it's going to very simply look like this, except this rather than being ball color, it's going to be self dot. This rather than being ball underscore for X, it's going to be self dot X. This one is just going to be self dot Y. And this one is going to be self.size. All right, so there's my render. Now I also need a move. And we also had code for move. That was down in our main uh, code here. That was all this stuff down here to make it uh, move and then bounce. So I'm going to grab all of this stuff. Let's do a control X on that. And we're going to put that up inside of here. And again, I can highlight that and tab it over control right bracket. All right, now on this, we're going to do a lot of that self dot thing again, self dot. And so in fact, I'm just going to highlight this. Oops, what happened here?
itself dot. I think I hit the wrong key. Control C. All right, there we go. So this is self dot speed. And over here, this is self dot angle. For each of these. And let's go down the rest of this. So ball X, that's going to be self dot X. Ball Y, self dot Y. Self dot X. DX is a local variable, so it doesn't need a self in front of it. But that does. So notice this is really, we're doing the same thing that we did in the non-object-oriented version. But there's going to be a tremendous advantage that we're going to see here in a second for doing uh, for doing this in this object in a way. So we did it's the same code, the same way we bounced, the same way we rendered, the same way we moved, the same way we set up those initial variables. We just it, again, object-oriented programming is a way of organizing the code. But notice that what it's done is inside of the ball object. We've got the code that goes with it to move the ball, to render the ball, and to set up or initialize the variables of the ball. And we've got those variables collected inside here as well. So now that we have this class set up, we can now use it down here. So in my code, I can say ball1 equal ball. So that's making an instance. And now in my code, notice how clean my main code is going to become here. So to move it and render it, here, let's just do that right here. So let's say move the ball. So ball1.move. Ball1.render. So notice how clean the main loop is now. What are we doing? We're moving the ball and rendering it. And then before the main loop, we created it. And that ran all the stuff in the constructor automatically. Let's run it. And there it is. Notice it's moving and bouncing the same way. Uh, as it was before. And if I run that again, notice it's moving at a different angle, different speed. Now what's really cool about what we just did here, and for fun, let, let's actually give these uh, different colors too. Let's actually make the color a little bit random here too. So random dot rand int. 0 to 255. And let's not make it 0. Let's make it 100 to 255. So we get, don't get ones that are black. All right, so let's run that. So now we'll get a different color on different runs in addition to a different speed and direction. But now what I want to do is something that this is where the you start to see the power. Because right now it just looks like, well, we just organize stuff differently put stuff in different places. And while that might have cleaned up this main, we also ended up having to add some code. We had to add this line here to create the instance. We had to add the this weird construct here with this init thing and this render and this move function. So we've added several lines. But here's where the power of object-oriented programming comes from. Now, notice if I want two balls or three, I can do that. And down here, Move one, render one, move two, render two, move three, render three. Now we run this. Now suddenly we're going to have three of those things all moving around, starting at different places, moving at different speeds, and bouncing. So notice how easy that is now um, to make three of those. And also notice that the, the code itself is still really pretty clean. You can say, Take a look at that code. You can say, okay, well, before the loop, I made three ball objects, object instances, and then I moved them all. And really, we could reorganize this code. If I were doing this, I might move all three and then render all three. So, and as we're going to see in a second, uh, so move all of them, render all of them, will have the same effect. OK, so pretty cool. Uh, and now you can see the power of that, because look how clean our main loop looks. 
create three balls, move all three of them, render all three of them, update the display. So we don't have any of that logic in here. In fact, it's all kind of encapsulated inside of a ball object because that's what it goes with. How do we render a ball? Goes in the ball object. How do we move a ball? Goes inside the ball object. How do we keep track of its position and its angle and its speed and its color and its size? It's part of the object, stick it inside of there. It's all encapsulated or uh, kind of organized in such a way that the data associated with that object is inside the object and the functionality, the methods of that object are all uh, part of that object as well. And now notice that would mean that I can't do things to this ball that it wasn't designed to do. I can't, uh, it's only limit, it's limited by what it can do and what data is associated with it. And we can make sure that those things match kind of the real world uh, analog to those. Now let's go back to the, uh, um, to the uh, slides for just a second here. All right, so we made that, we made the ball thing, we added the attributes, we added the methods, and we made three instances of it, and we used the three instances of it. Now, for lists of objects now, this is gonna be something that's gonna open up the capabilities to even more, something more powerful. And this is actually a really cool uh, thing. That if you remember from last lecture where we talked about lists and sequences, we said that lists could be lists of anything. So we, we made, for example, lists of strings. We maybe had lists of um, uh, numbers. We had even had lists of other lists. And one of the coolest things uh, about this is that, well, a now that we can make object instances, we could actually store those inside of a list. So we could have a list of balls rather than just a single one. And then the for loop that we used before that went through every one of those instances, we could actually have the for loop go through uh, every instance of a ball and then do something with it. So let's do that really quick. So let's go back to our uh, ball example and make a list of balls. So that the one that had the three balls bouncing around, let's do that with a list instead of each one individually. And you're gonna start to see that, that there's some really cool things that are going to happen here. All right, so here it is this way. And I'm actually good before I edit this, I'm going to do a save as. If you're following along at home, you could do that and say save as. And let's call this oop ball two, which is going to be, and I'll put even here, list of balls. And maybe I'll put a dash so we can remember which one's which. So up here, when I create this ball instance like that, I'm not going to keep track of it like this. I'm going to make a variable called ball list. And I'm going to start that out as an empty list. So this is a list that has nothing in it right now. Empty. But then I'm going to make a for loop here. I'm going to say for i in range 3. So this is going to go through three times. And what am I going to do is I'm going to add to that ball list a ball instance. So ball list. How do I add something to a list? Well, the easiest way is to add something to the end, so append. And what are we appending? We're going to call this ball uh, class and have it create a ball for us. All right, so looking at this code, what's happening here is we're going to say, hey, th start with an empty list <coughs> and then go through three times and append a ball to the end of that list. So we're going to have three balls now in that list. Now, back in our code down here, notice what I can do is I can replace this with now a for loop. It says for ball in ball list. So that's our list of them up here. And remember the for loop goes through one at a time, assigning this to each one. So this, the first time is gonna be the first ball. The second time it's gonna be the second one. The third time it's gonna be the third one. And what do we wanna do each time through that list? Well, we're just gonna move each ball and render each ball. But now, rather than saying ball one, ball two, ball three, I can just say ball.move, ball.render. Because this variable now is adopting the value of each of the instances. So the first time, this is gonna be the first item in the list. And then the next time through the loop, it'll be the second one. So this is equivalent to saying ball one move, ball one render, ball two move, ball two render, ball three move, ball three render. But it's doing it all for us by iterating through that list and since that's a list of ball instances, 
that works just like those instances down here. So really cool. Let's run that. So now it's still three balls bouncing around. And now this brings us to where something really cool is going to happen. So that's three balls bouncing around. Watch what happens if I just change this one number now. Instead of making three, let's make a hundred of them. Bam, a hundred different things all moving around. They all have their own color. They all have their own speed. They all have their own X and Y position. Really, really cool uh, thing. And notice that that didn't take any more code than making three. And in fact, this takes less code uh, than it did earlier when we had the, the three, just the three bouncing around without using that list of objects. And in fact, if I want to add more, I don't know, let's make 500 of them. Now we've got 500 of those things all over here. Now right now, uh, they're all the same size. Let's actually look at that. Let's give them random sizes too. Let's go between five and 15. Okay, so now we've got different sizes of them, different colors. And we've got 500 of them all moving around at the same time. And again, notice how simple, drop dead simple, our main loop is. This is the entire main loop right here to get 500 of those things. We've made an empty list. We filled it with 500 balls. And then our main loop just says, hey, for every one of those balls in that ball list, let's move it, let's render it. And then we update the display. And we get this really complex, cool uh, effect of having 500 things all operating independently and moving around and doing whatever they want to do. Okay, really cool. Now, a couple final things uh, in this lecture that I want to go over. So let's go ahead and get to that since we're running a little short on lectures uh, remaining in the semester. So I'm going to get through uh, another little bit of information today. But the stuff that we just learned today here, this is going to be incredibly useful for making games. All right, let's go back to the, our uh, slides. Give me just a second here, switch back to that. Okay, so this list of objects, we just did that ball example, a couple examples with that. Let's go on. So one of the things now is you might be able to start to see the power of using object-oriented programming for games. So for example, those lists of objects and just the objects themselves can be used for all kinds of things. The player can have uh, like the a health attribute, a score, a position, armor, experience points, gold. And if you have to think of a multiplayer game where there are multi pe multiple people logging in, each of the players will have their own health and score and position and uh, armor class and experience points and gold, and they go on campaigns together and they have their own list of achievements. You can start to see how you can do that with object-oriented programming. Also bullets, as somebody, like you have like a, a first-person shooter, or a game, something like that, or uh, maybe the players in Among Us, uh, which ones the imposters and which ones aren't, that's an attribute associated with that object. But bullets here, uh, all of them are going to have a position and a speed and a direction and maybe a lifetime that way they exist for a certain amount of time before they disappear. Uh, so they're not traveling through the world forever. Uh, maybe they would have an owner assigned to them or an ID assigned to them so you know which person shot that bullet. So when it hits somebody and kills them, who gets credit for the kill? <coughs> but notice you might have dozens or hundreds or even thousands of bullets all flying around in some big multiplayer first person shooter game uh, that and it would be important to track all of them. But every one of those bullets is really just an instance of the same kind of class. Maybe the enemies are non player characters. They have a place where they are on the map. They have a disposition. Are they happy with you? Are they angry with you? Do they want to fight you? Do they want to help you? Do they want to talk to you? Uh, they might also have some sort of state. Uh, in other words, are they sleeping? Are they awake? Are they hungry? Are they af afraid? Whatever. Uh, this HP, how many hit points do they currently have? Uh, maybe the part of the state would also be alive and dead. A, a race, are they 
elf, an orc, or a gnome, or a, a thief, or a wizard, or whatever. Uh, some sort of classification. So there's all kinds of things you could store about that. They could also store something about whether or not you've encountered them before, how you treated them when you encountered them before. Or they could have things related to their AI, like maybe if they're uh, hungry, they are foraging for food. Or maybe if they're, they need food, then they're more likely to try to attack you and take what you have. All right, treasures. Where? What type of treasure? What's the value of it? Where is it on the map? Uh, things like that. Uh, weapons, uh, the type, the condition, how much ammo it has, the position on the map, where it is currently. Um, other things about like how much uh, of different, I guess, uh, attributes that it has associated with uh, how often it can fire and uh, how uh, much damage that the, it does when it hits somebody, things like that. And then also particle effects, like sparks that are flying out of things or magic st stuff swirling around something or uh, little fireflies like above a campfire. All those can be done really easily with objects. Uh, the type of particle, the size, the color, the lifetime, and the color might change over time as it comes out of there, or smoke particles or something like that. So particle effects and a ton of other things like the maps themselves, the uh, could be on there, the inventory uh, that has items inside of it and the inventory item, uh, the different classes of that. But these objects can be, because they closely model things in the real world, they're really useful for games because a game is kind of an analog to a real world uh, thing. So just like here, we could all be playing a massive simulation right now and I've acquired the stapler object and put it in my inventory. I'm storing it in my like house here. So this could all be like an elaborate thing, a lot like uh, I don't know, like Terraria or something like that. This is my house that I think is real, but it's really not. And I have items, objects, instances that I've acquired, pens and screwdrivers and tweezers and things like that. So objects, really useful. Now, a couple final things here that it turns out that, and this is important, we talked earlier about at the factory, like this pen was made red while this one was made blue. And so one of the things that comes up is like, well, maybe when we create an object, we want to tell it how we want it to be created or what we want it to be like. So at the pen factory, I want to be able to create like a, a pen, but I want to say, I want to make a blue one this time and I want to make a red one the next time. And to do that, we have to pass things into uh, our constructor in order to tell it what we want to do. And it turns out we might want to, for a ball class, for example, we want to say, I want to make a ball, but I want it to start at this position, have this color and this position and this speed. So right with our last example, it was just making them randomly. They were all showing up at random places with different angles and different speeds, but we might want to control where they get created and what color they are and what speed they are and what direction they're traveling and so forth. So the way we do that is just by passing parameters to that uh, constructor, the underscore underscore init underscore underscore method. And the way we do that is you, just like with other functions, you just list them here. The only difference is we still have this self thing at the beginning, and we can ignore that except to we're in the define here. When we use it, we would just pass these in. And notice that you can also have uh, attributes that have defaults. So if I don't provide them, it'll pick a size of 5 and an angle of 0 and a speed of 0 0.5 and a color of white. But if I do provide them, then it will override those and put in whatever we want to put. Now the rest of this can work the same way it did before. We're just passing those things in. So notice here, we can now create object instances that are have the attributes that we want them to have when we create them. In other words, rather than just creating one and then replacing those values, we can actually say, hey, create a ball, but make it at this position and this size and this angle and this speed. And that can be important for uh, a lot of objects. For example, a bullet when it gets created. When you fire a gun, it doesn't make a random bullet somewhere in the universe going in a random direction. It makes it come out of that gun at the position of the gun. And what angle is it traveling? Well, the angle that you had the gun pointed at. So uh, in a first person shooter, that can be uh, important. Uh, it could also be important for other things. When an enemy spawns, you want to spawn at a certain spawn point in a certain location, not some random place on the map. Uh, maybe when um, health boxes get created, you want to put them at very specific spots on the map uh, in strategic locations or ammo boxes or something like that. 
And so part of that game design is deciding where you want those objects to be and how you want the gameplay to continue. Uh, and so in order to do that, rather than having just randomly thrown around on the map in random places and maybe have it be impossible or stupidly easy, you want to place those things. Well, we can tell where we want things or how we want them to be when we create them by passing things into that constructor. And you can also pass data to these methods. Uh, for example, the render method, we might want to pass something in uh, to that to change how it's rendered or maybe change the surface upon which it's rendered. You can do that. You can pass things to those as well. And it works the same way it does. Okay, we just after the self always has to be the first thing. And then after that, we list any other attributes we want. If we don't have any, we don't need to put things after the self, but we need to have the self there. That's what gives the uh, the code inside of here access to the object instance itself. All right, let's write a little bit more code, but this time we're going to create a bullet class. And it's going to be really similar to the ball class. I'm just going to, so, so to save some time, since we're already uh, almost an hour here today, I'm going to actually just edit the ball class. I'm going to save it as bullet. But the thing I want to change is I want to make it so we can control the position where the bullets get created. So it's going to get created wherever the mouse is uh, on the screen. And I want to have it so when I press the space bar, it creates a bullet wherever the mouse is. And when a bullet leaves the screen, we're going to remove it from the list. All right, so let's do that. So let's start with that ball example again. And before I do that, I'm going to do a file save as. And I'm going to call this bullet. And actually, I'll make it bullet list. All right, so up here, I'm going to change the title, bullet. I'm going to change this class. But when I change this, I'm going to change some things here. So rather than having this always be random, like it is there, I'm going to say, self.x, or I mean x, y. So when we create a bolt, we always need an x and a y. And I'm going to say we also always need an angle. The speed, um, I'm going to give that a, a default speed of 1.0. I'm going to give that a, a default. That should be an equal. Am I getting a minus? There we go, equal 1.0. I have to type kind of raised up, so it's a little bit hard. And let's give it a, a default color. Let's just make the default white. And let's give it a default size. Let's make the size fairly small because these are bullets and not balls. So, so down here, I just need to fill these in. So size at the self.x is going to be x, self.y is going to be y, self.angle is going to be angle. And notice that the way I wrote the parameter uh, list up here, these three are required. These ones have defaults, so they're optional. So I need to provide the angle, speed, color. And then finally, size. Now this stuff down here, uh, we're going to leave that alone. That stuff, we're going to take that off. But in this case, let's say I don't want it to bounce off the edges for the bullets. I want them to actually disappear completely. So in order for, to get these to disappear completely when we get to the edges, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add another attribute here, and I'm going to call it alive. And I'm going to say, well, it starts out, it's it's true that it's actually alive in the system. So down here in my code, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say if it ever gets to be uh, less than zero, then self.alive goes to false. And I'm just going to do that for all of these. So this code is going to look very similar, but this what this is doing is saying if the bullet hits the edge of the screen, it goes it's going to go away. And then I'm going to show you how to take that out of the list here in a second.
And now since we're just getting rid of that, there's no need to have this thing where we're converting back because we're not bouncing it off the edges. So in other words, we just update its position and then we see if it's left the screen. If it's left the screen, then we're going to remove it from our list. All right, and we're not going to start off with 500 of these anymore. We're going to call this bullet list. And we're not going to put any of them in the list to start with. All right, so what we have uh, so far, we've got an empty bullet list. We're not, we are going to end up moving all of them down here. So for bullet, in bullet list. And then we're going to move each one and we're going to render each one. And then we're going to, oops, I notice I have not switched over to that. So here, let me go back through that again here. Hold on with just a second. I'll rewind. Back. Okay. So I realized you couldn't see what I was doing. So let me just go back through and explain to you what I did. So here I changed this to bullet instead of ball. I changed this so that we're passing in these parameters, X, Y, angle, speed, color, size. I gave speed, color, and size default values, but X, Y, and angle are required. We have to pass those in. And then I just changed all these self.x equal x, self.y equal y, angle, speed. So now, and I also added this self.alive thing here. And what I'm doing with that is when I move it, rather than having it bounce off the edges, We're going to have the bullet die when it hits the edges. In other words, if the X gets less than zero, then we set alive to false. If X gets bigger than 799, alive goes to false and same thing all this. So we could have combined all these in a big war, I suppose. But we'll just keep it like this because it's analogous to what we did before. Now, what we're going to do in our uh, code down here, though, is what we said we wanted to do is we said we wanted to get the mouse X and Y position. And then what we want to do with that is we want to say if the space bar is pressed, we want to make a bullet where the mouse is. Okay, so let's do that. So what I'm going to do here is uh, we're still going to move all of them, still going to render all of them, but I want to check to see if keys pygame.k underscore space. So if they press the space bar, this is where we want to create a, a new bullet. Okay, so how do I create a new bullet? We're going to say bullet list dot append a bullet object. But the bullet object, we need to pass some things into that. We need to pass an x coordinate, which is going to be the mouse x. We need to pass in the y coordinate, which is going to be mouse y. And then we need to pass in a direction. So for direction right now, uh, I'm just going to say direction, and we're going to put those in here. So mx comma my equal uh, pi game dot mouse dot get position, and then direction. Right now, I'm just going to make it random. So random dot int zero three fifty nine. We'll we'll narrow that direction down here in a little bit. So now we're creating one at that random direction at the position of the mouse whenever the space bar is pressed. And then what are we going to do? We're going to move all of them. We're going to render all of them. Now, one thing, though, that we haven't done is we now need a way to reclaim any bullets after they're moved and rendered. Uh, so I'm going to add a thing here. Okay, let me add a comment on this, too. We want to remove any of them that are dead uh, from that list. So here we're going to go back through that uh, bullet list again. And I'm going to uh, present a way to do this that will solve a problem. There, there, there's a couple ways we could do this. One of them has some subtle bugs in it. And so what I'm going to do is 
actually, I'm going to do this a little bit differently. I'm going to come up here, and before this loop, I'm going to say bullets to remove list is empty. And what I'm going to do is after I move a bullet, I'm going to see if it's alive or if it's dead. So I'm going to say if the bullet that we were on that we just moved alive equal false, then I'm going to add it to this bullets to remove list. So in other words, I'm going to build up the ones that need to be removed. So in other words, if this if I moved this bullet and now it's dead where it was alive before, then I'm going to add it to the list of ones to be removed. So in other words, I'm kind of, I have a separate list in my hand. I'm saying, oh, that one needs to go away. And I move this other one. That one needs to go away. And the next one needs to go. And well, the reason we're, rather, we're doing that rather than just removing it from the list, that bullet from the list right now, is notice we're going through this list. And if I remove it from the list I'm going through, then I remove that one I'm on. The other ones will go down. And when I get to the bottom of the loop and I go to the next one, I will have skipped over one. So we'll get one that doesn't move when that happens for that iteration. And that could create problems later on for us. So now we're going to remove any of them uh, from the list. So here we're going to go through the bullets to remove list. And now we're just going to delete that out of that, out of the main list. So bullet list dot remove uh, bullet. All right, let's run that. Now, notice that we don't have anything right now. And notice if I press spacebar though, <laughs> and notice it's sending them out very quickly. And you notice when they hit the edge, they're just disappearing. Now, notice what would happen if I just took out the uh, code that was deleting them. So let's just comment out this loop right here for right now. So right now it's going to mark them as dead. But it's going to leave them in the list. Oops, spacebar. And you notice that it's getting slower and slower and slower because we have like now bunches of bullets that are off the screen. So we've got probably thousands of bullets now that are still traveling around. Here, let me add one other thing so you can see exactly what's going on a little bit better here. And that's why we build in that thing to reclaim them is because we didn't really want them to uh, leave the screen and stay in our world forever once we've created them, because it's just going to take up more and more memory. We're still moving them when they're not relevant to the game anymore. So let me add one other thing so you can do. Let's only allow this to move when they're alive. So if self.alive is true, then we allow it to move this. So we'll just indent this underneath that. So now what you'll see, you see them sticking to the edge of the screen now. And you can start to see why it's getting to get slower and slower as we're creating those. You'll notice the whole edge is now covered with bullets that are still being uh, drawn. It's still trying to move them even though it's, they're not moving anymore. And so now we've got probably like I don't know, thousands and thousands of these bullet objects now in memory, all still just hanging out around the edge of the screen. So that's why it's important to reclaim them. So now if we add that code back in that reclaims them, you'll notice them disappearing. So we just do that, and we do that. And now when they're dead, they're dead. And you'll notice now it's not going to slow, it'll slow down a little bit as we get a lot of them. Also, it would help if we had a, a frame rate. Now let's add one other thing here. Notice this, this shows us how particle effects can work. That looks like a kind of fireworks going on there. So you can imagine like an explosion happens in the game. Particles go out. Now let's limit the range of the bullets now instead uh, of what we were doing there. So rather than creating them in a random direction, Let's make them in a direction that rather than zero, let's make it uh, 10 degrees to minus 10 degrees. So now let's shoot, shoot them out to the right. Oops. Oh, we, hold on, I screwed that up. 
This needs to be the smaller number. That needs to be the larger number. And now you notice we get this kind of shotgun blast going off to the side. And now you might think, well, this, that's a lot of bullets coming out of there, spraying out of that thing all at one time. Maybe we want to limit that some. Maybe we want it to slow that down. So the next question is, how do we create like a, uh, a recharge time? So where it will fire and then it will take a certain amount of time before it will fire the next one. Because this is kind of ridiculous. It's just like a fire hose more than it is like a gun shooting bullets. Now we can still kind of move it. It's pretty cool. But it's still like a fire hose more than it is like a gun. So how do we get to shoot just one at a time? All right, there's a couple ways to do that. Uh, one of the ways that I'm going to show you is to have a cool down for that gun. So up here, when we go to fire it, this is where we're firing it. We want to make a cool down. So in other words, when I press space bar, I only want this to fire when the cool down uh, has been reached. So I'm going to add another variable here. Let's, let's call it like gun cool down. And let's start it at zero. So what we're going to do is the only time I'm going to create this new bullet and add it to the list is if the gun cool down is equal to zero. So if the cooldown is zero, we allow it to fire. Now, if the cooldown is not zero, then we do gun cooldown minus equal one. So we subtract one from it. Now notice that's uh, the idea there is we, when we fire the gun, we're going to set the cooldown to some level. So in here, let's just say So we press space, if gun cooldown is zero, it lets it fire and it sets gun cooldown to 10. And then uh, that. Now one of the things that I would suggest doing is let's take this, uh, this part out of here. So they don't have to be pressing space to do that. So here I'm just going to say if gun cooldown is greater than zero, then gun cooldown minus equal one. So in other words, we're setting it up to 10. Every time through the loop, we're going to subtract one from it until we get to zero, and then it allows it to fire another bullet, and then it starts the cooldown period again. And so that's how many frames uh, before that. So let's go and fire that. Now notice we're getting a lot fewer of them, something a little more like a gun. So if we want it to be uh, even less than that, we just set a higher cooldown when they fire the gun. So here we may say like 100. Every 100 frames, we're gonna, it's going to allow us to have a new bullet. So now it looks a little more like a gun, a little bit of randomness when we try to fire it. The 10 degree spread on that. But now a lot more like a gun, like more like a machine gun. But that shows you how you can do a cooldown. Now right now, the the this is the number of frames. So let's add a comment there. That's the frames before the next bullet is allowed. And right now we don't have any uh, control on the frame rate to limit the frame rate. We talked about how to do that in the past. Uh, let's go and add that. So we let's do like a 120 frames a second. And then the, we can then this cooldown period will be based on time. So let's go and add that. So that's the last thing we'll do today. And then we'll stop. So let's go before our loop. Let's do FPS clock equal pi game dot time dot clock. So that creates a clock object. And then in here, let's do FPS clock dot tick. And let's put 120 in there. And so now notice everything is moving much more slowly. because we're limiting our frame rate at 120. And that's a good idea because that means it's not now not coupled to 
the speed of somebody's computer. So you might have, if you don't put that frame rate control in there, then you're going to end up with games that uh, run blazingly fast on somebody who has a really high-end gaming machine so fast that they might not even be playable, and then you run them on another machine and they might look reasonable. So this is kind of locking the frame rate if the game can support it at 120 hertz. But that also now lets me set this, that firing speed. So at 100, we're getting a little less than uh, a second between each bullet. If I were to set that at 60 for my cooldown period, I'll get two bullets per second. Let's go back up and do that. That's down here. Sixty. So, one hundred twenty psych frames per second. Sixty. We're gonna get a bullet every half second. And if I want ten bullets a second, then I could set that cooldown period uh, to twelve. All right, I lied. I'm going to add one final thing. Well, let's stop there. I don't want to get this uh, example code too confusing. But you'll notice that really the, the object, the class for the bullet, very similar to the ball class, except that we set, made this self.alive uh, attribute. And when the ball leaves the screen, we set it to where it's dead. And then we only move the ball when it is alive. And then down in our program down here, we're basically going through and saying, hey, any of the bullets that are now dead, let's add them to this list to remove them. And then down here, we're getting rid of them. We're saying, hey, any of them that we determined needed to be removed, let's just take them out of that list. But our main program is still super clean, super easy, even though we can have uh, hundreds or thousands of bullets all moving around at the same time. Uh, so let's go ahead and switch back to the... Uh, presentation for a second. And let's, uh, so we made that, we made it so the space bar is pressed, it puts the bullet on the screen uh, at the position of the mouse. It's a little bit, maybe we should have done the left click instead of the space bar. We could have used arrow keys to move a cannon up and down, had it fire out of the position of the cannon. Uh, that would be something that we could do next time. But that's it for now. Uh, look at that next lab assignment. The next lab assignment, you're going to be able to use some of those object-oriented programming things um, to create uh, an asteroids-type game where things, asteroids are going to fall from the sky. They're going to, uh, you're going to have a cannon that moves back and forth and fires bullets in the upward direction. If the bullets collide with the asteroids, then you're going to remove the asteroid and remove the bullet. And you're going to also have uh, when the asteroids get all the way to the ground, they're going to kill some people. Uh, and when your population gets to zero, it's game over. So it's kind of like a uh, planet defense game, kind of like tower defense, but you're defending against the asteroids falling from the sky. Uh, also, be ready for the paper part of the final exam. Uh, that is going to be uh, Monday, uh, actually one week from today. So that's going to be Monday the 23rd. So before you leave campus, uh, we're going to have that final exam, the paper part of that. I will post a study guide, so look for that uh, being posted as well. And make sure to study for that, be ready for that. And we are going to cover a couple additional topics, and then I'm probably going to post a bonus lab. Uh, so if you miss some points and want to make them up, do that. I'm also going to do something where that I don't usually do, and that is that on the final exam, if you do better on the final than you did on the midterm, then I will adopt the grade that you got on the final exam for the midterm. So in other words, let's say you got a 50 on the midterm and you work really hard for the rest of the semester and you end up getting like a 75 on the final or a 90 on the final. It's like you got a 90 or on both or 75 on both. So you can really improve your grade if you struggled in the first part of the class by studying, making sure you're ready for the final. The final exam is going to have two parts. The paper part will be on uh, the 23rd, uh, as I just announced. The programming part will be kind of like a little lab, uh, and that will be uh, posted on uh, during final exam week at the normal uh, final exam time. 
and you'll have a little more time to do that. It's kind of like a take home programming part of the test. Uh, so make sure to look for that as well. But I will send out an email that describes all of that to everybody. Uh, so look at that email, but make sure you're ready for that paper part of the final exam. The study guide that I'm going to post is going to have some uh, example stuff on it. Uh, so be ready for that. And anything that we covered up through today's lecture is fair game to put on there. Uh, so just be ready. All right, so that's it for today. And I will see everybody shortly. And uh, if you have questions or problems, let me know. Other than that, uh, I look forward to kind of finishing up the semester and hopefully the object-oriented stuff makes sense. Um, if it helps, I can post those example programs uh, in a zip file so you can download them and look at them and use those as a basis. Uh, that could help you tremendously with that next lab assignment uh, by having a starting point for some of that. All right, I'll stop there. Thanks. Stay safe.